Well, there we go, from uh, the Middle East to Ireland. Uh, it's uh, this evening's Ask Your Herb Doctor. My name's Andrew Murray. My name's Sarah Johannesson Murray. For those of you who perhaps have never listened to the shows, they run every Friday, uh, every third Friday, sorry, from uh, 7.30 to 8 p.m. We have callers, but they run from 7 to 8 o'clock on the third Friday of every month. Um, we've been for a long time now, been very pleased to have Dr. Raymond Pete joining us uh, with various different topics. Um, this month will be no exception. Um, I wanted to try and do some kind of a... Um, Gosh, an introduction or some kind of a, an outline, a basis, something in which I know that people listening uh, to these podcasts who I get emails from regularly all over the world, uh, not just the States, um, who've been listening to them, have found them interesting and informative, and it's led them to read research from people that Dr. Pete's mentioned on the show, or they've had conditions and illnesses and they've recovered, uh, listening to Dr. Pete's advice, um, et cetera, et cetera. So I'm very much aware that this is a real resource with which people are being reached, and there will always be those people uh, who are looking for something different, something alternative, uh, as well as those people who are not looking and they, they won't listen and they've already got their path set out. But there's plenty of people who are looking for alternatives and so that's what the uh, thrust of this show has been for the last uh, 12 years probably. But um, So, as I said, we're very pleased to have Dr. Raymond Peter join us and I wanted to do an outline uh, starting this month uh, with endocrinology as the subject and I wanted to just to outline the uh, nervous system as a whole uh, and then we're going to get into Parkinson's disease and Parkinsonism and a few of the other little subsets uh, that are similar um, as an introduction to the endocrine system and then maybe next month uh, we'll get into the pituitary I know we've mentioned a lot about thyroid hormones and Dr. Pete's his main speciality is uh, Hormone, hormone physiology. So, and then the thymus, the adrenals, uh, pancreas, ovaries, and testes as other sources uh, of hormones and how they affect health, and how everything that we do can consciously interact for good or bad uh, with our health. Uh, we're not at the mercy uh, of anything in particular. We make choices, um, and so each one of us, uh, just by hearing and listening. Uh, and then going ahead and reading and seeing the, the, the facts and the science, um, people can find further information to support everything Dr. Pete's been uh, shouting from the rooftops for for the last 30, 40 years. Uh, so are you there, Dr. Pete? Yes. Well, thanks so much for joining us. Um, so I wanted to uh, try to explore the endocrine system in a large topic I know, uh, but one I feel would be a useful exercise in understanding physiology from your perspective, Dr. Pete, and you make... Uh, regular mention of pioneering scientists whose works give a better appreciation of the physiological processes occurring in the body and often provide a new direction away from the hijacked modern scientific theories we're cultured to accept, a lot of which are a Pandora's box of ever-increasing drug dependencies and conspiracies abound along with that train of thought. Um, given we are truly complex organisms with a network of communication systems, and feedback either positive or negative to that input. Uh, the pathways through which these signals travel as well as the structures which respond to the signals and the signals which ultimately affect another system all need to be cohesively organized. So any deficit, however small, can have far-reaching and dramatic consequences and it is true that the organism will do everything possible to correct or mitigate disease before failing, uh, sometimes resulting in disease processes that take decades to end in death. And so communication systems and appropriate responses are key to good health and functioning. And this is the role of the endocrine system I want to explore with you, Dr. Pete. Uh, the earliest records of recognising the role, and it may be earlier than this, but the earliest records that I found during my last two days or so getting material together for the show was the uh, Chinese pulling out uh, isolated sex and pituitary hormones from human urine in 200 BC, for crying out loud. So uh, that's, tr that's certainly food for thought when we think uh, we know everything that we uh, know now with uh, ICP, MS and other mass spectrometry being the kind of uh, leading uh, investigative uh, machinery. So, um, And then obviously the ancient Greeks and Romans uh, from Aristotle, Hippocrates and Galen and where we get our herbal medicine background from until the emergence of the germ theory 
And I know you mentioned this a lot in the uh, 19th century then, and this is, I think, is perhaps where it just veered off of uh, normality and, and, and common sense and uh, it's a real, true scientific endeavour. Uh, that's where it kind of just veered off the rails, and I think we've carried on in that vein ever since. And I know that your whole philosophy has been about challenging um, mainstream science for science's sake because it's not very scientific. And um, I think in that in that regard, Dr. Pete, would you mind giving an overview um, of the basis of understanding disease past to present and how this has uh, formed our approach uh, to its management and how your rationale differs? Um, I, I see it um, as a, a, a deviation from, from the Chinese and the Greeks who had... A, a pretty uh, unified picture of what an organism is. Um, Aristotle uh, actually uh, was uh, pretty much an organicist in his understanding of, of the organism. And it, it was really around the time of Descartes, uh, middle of the, the early part of the um, 17th century, when uh, the things really got formalized on the, on the wrong track. Uh, Descartes uh, described the organism as a machine uh, completely separate from uh, consciousness. Uh, conscience, consciousness was uh, guiding the machine possibly from uh, some contact point in the brain. Mm. Um, but um, under, under the uh, ground... Uh, most mostly uh, people who were persecuted by the, by uh, the monarchies and such, um, they continued to think along the uh, organic, uh, unified understanding of, of of what an animal or a person is. But um, following Descartes, uh, uh, the organism was seen as made up of parts, just like a steam engine mm-hmm. or a clock. Uh, each part uh, could be defined and understood and uh, mechanically interlocked with the other parts. And uh, the consciousness or the soul was seen as something uh, completely separate from this machine uh, and uh, could uh, somehow uh, sometimes inter- interfere with its operation. But uh, mostly it was uh, uh, out of our control simply running according to um, causal determinism. And uh, when uh, the idea of infection, uh, something from the environment causing a disease, mm. came in, uh, it happened that uh, the, the use of the microscope had developed to the point that uh, uh, people had seen the compartments in uh, plants and uh, they called the, the compartment cells. Uh, when the plant dried up, it left the, the cellulose framework, empty little chambers, which they called cells, <clears throat> um, while uh, a more underground approach uh, looked at particles like red blood cells and called the units corpuscles, little bodies, mm-hmm. rather than mm-hmm. uh, empty <laughs> compartments. And uh, the, uh, this idea of breaking the organism down into uh, uh, cells and uh, seeing those as parts of a, a machine made up of material without uh, consciousness or spirit, uh, uh, this uh, be- became uh, uh, the background for, for seeing a disease as uh, as particular mechanical interference uh, with the uh, operation of, of the machine. And this is where the term reductionism came from, right, or reductionist medicine? Uh, yeah, and, and the disease, uh, well, one line of thinking was that it was a particular little particle of evil material, <laughs> a, a, a germ cell analogous to the cells that make up the machine. So it was a, a, a 
material particle interfering with our material particles uh, that became identified as a disease, a very concrete, specific interference uh, with the machine. And uh, as people looked more closely at tumors, they, they saw really it was uh, a matter of organization rather than uh, some particular uh, uh, concrete uh, change or substance. But this idea of organization took about 150 years <laughs> to um, finally catch on uh, right up until uh, the beginning of this century. Uh, people were still uh, stuck on Descartes' picture of a mechanical organism uh, being interrupted by something right down on the cellular level or even smaller, the molecular level. So the cancer was uh, defined as an evil cell, a mutant cell <clears throat> containing bad genetic material, uh, defective DNA. Um, and uh, so all you had to do in the case of a, a germ-caused disease, all you had to do was kill the germ and you were cured. In the case of the uh, cancer interpreted as a mutant cell, <clears throat> all you had to do was eliminate every single uh, individual mutant cell and the disease would be cured. Well, I mean, uh, that, that's still how they treat cancer now, isn't it? I mean, to some still, degree. Still, uh, almost everyone is, is still stuck in this 17th century idea of what an organism is and what a disease is. And Parkinson's disease, uh, even though in, in the 19th century, uh, people recognized uh, that all the symptoms of the disease, stiffness, uh, generally uh, the, the older person is, the more uh, Parkinson's traits they have, stiffness, uh, wobbly uh, tremor, uh, and uh, uh, slowness of move, movement, uh, all of the uh, extreme old age symptoms are, are simply coming on stronger and earlier when they call it Parkinson's disease. But in by the uh, latter part of the 19th century, uh, people had noticed that people suffering from this so-called disease, if they... <laughs> took a long train ride to get to the doctor, their symptoms hmm. might disappear. Or if they came on a, a, a carriage or rode a horse, uh, their symptoms were greatly alleviated by, uh, by just moving around through space. And uh, so uh, some people proposed a vibration therapy. Uh, about 40 years ago, someone noticed that uh, swimming alleviated the symptoms. Uh, so uh, simply a different kind of stimulation could reverse the, the symptoms. And it turns out that um, in animals, you can create the disease by poisoning them. Yep. And uh, by giving them an enriched environment, you can reverse the actual uh, anatomical chemical changes of their nervous system. So in the poisoned animals, if you place them in an enriched environment, you're saying yeah, that they no yeah. longer display the... Yeah, similar to what they noticed uh, in people who took a long train ride. <laughs> uh -huh. All right, you're listening to Ask Your Herb, Dr. K. Midi Garberville, 91.1 FM. I had 7.15 now, so from 7.30 till the end of the show at 8 o'clock, you're invited to call in with questions either related, hopefully related to the question subject matter of the endocrine system uh, and Parkinson's. If you have any other endocrine-based questions, that would be fine too. Um, if you're in the area, it seems like there's still a temporary call-in number, which is 707 uh, 383 9007, so 383 The toll-free numbers should still be the same here, 1-800-KMUD-RAD. 
That's 800 568 3723. And the engineer, I think you're going to read some things out. Yeah, thanks, Andrew. I actually should have done this at the top of the hour. We would not have this show without the support of Chautauqua Natural Foods in Garberville. Locally owned for 34 years, they specialize in local and organic produce, natural groceries, nutritional supplements, and body care products. Now announcing every day is Senior Day. Chautauqua Natural Foods open Monday through Saturday, 9 till 7, Sundays 10 till 5, just off the town square. More information online at facebook.com slash Chautauqua Naturals. Support for our community radio station is coming as well from Emerald Kingdom, greenhouse.com. They've got information and products for all aspects of greenhouse growing, specializing in timer-run auto blackout light depot greenhouses. Emerald Kingdom Greenhouse also carries light depth for existing structure modification kits and good old-fashioned greenhouses. Accessories include plastic coverings, light traps, cooling pads, exhaust and ventilation systems. Emerald Kingdom, grow your future. The views and opinions expressed throughout the broadcast day are those of the speakers and not necessarily those of this station, its staff, or its underwriters. Time will be made available for other viewpoints. Thank you so much for joining us. Okay, so to continue, Dr. P, I um, wanted to explore Parkinson's disease and Parkinsonism, as there's several uh, different um, similar related uh, type situations that may not necessarily be Parkinson's per se, but it does actually seem to be a fairly woolly uh, kind of construct in terms of the multitude of various symptoms that can be expressed, some of which may start early, some of which may just be late onset. Um, But basically they go over the mechanism uh, that's discussed today about the disease and its treatment and highlight uh, your approach uh, to this condition later on to understand it the way you do. So the terms used to describe long-term degenerative disorder of the central nervous system affecting mainly the motor system, but which can involve the sensory system with cognitive and sleep and mood disturbances also noted as part of the picture. Uh, There's a compound here, and I know we talked about this the other day, alpha-synuclein, a compound present in these so-called Lewy bodies that are present uh, under microscopic examination, found within the substantia nigra. In the brain, right? Yeah, as well as several other brain regions, and they are diagnostic uh, for Parkinson's disease. Okay, so several Parkinson's genes are involved, and they've been hi- been highlighted here. I'd like to pick your brains about some of those as we go on through this. But uh, uh, so far as uh, the functioning of waste product digesting lysosomes uh, that may be linked to the inability to break down alpha synuclein, uh, there's a protein also called dardarin. Now, the primary symptoms of Parkinson's result from the loss of dopamine secreting cells within the substantia nigra. And there are five major pathways in the brain that we know now. Uh, There may be more, but there were five when I was studying. uh, Connecting other brain areas uh, with the basal ganglia. These are the motor, so this is a movement. (coughs) Ocular motor, where the eyes will track um, the hands or the the eye movement will track the movement externally. Uh, The associative, the limbic, and the orbitofrontal circuits. Now, all of them are disrupted, essentially, and this disruption explains the many uh, varied presentations of the disease. So in terms of how you understand um, the nervous system and physiology, just to start with uh, the motor circuit and how uh, higher brainstem functions interact through nerves to elicit muscular contraction, for example, because we will talk about the tremor of Parkinson's disease and We'll go on later to describe some of the drugs and treatments that can be used, but they are also responsible uh, chronically for the same symptoms such that it's almost a worse outcome than the initial outcome, so it's not a particularly successful treatment. Um, But in terms of the motor system of the nervous system uh, and the various um, drugs, second messengers, etc., that exert those controls... Um, how, do, how do you see this motor circuit working in the body and how would you perhaps uh, be able to rationalise an alternative approach uh, to the treatment of Parkinson's disease, given, given how you know? Um, my orientation is um, very similar to Pavlov's, um, who saw the motor system as 
subordinate to the sensory system. He saw the cortex of the brain as primarily a, an extension of the sense organs, and that this formed the environment uh, for the uh, motor reflexes. Uh, and uh, the idea of a reflex is another thing that originated with Descartes and is simply wrong. Uh, the, the cells aren't mechanically uh, connected in, in reflex patterns. Uh, uh, one of the um, first people in the West to analyze this carefully uh, was um, the French existentialist, so-called philosopher, uh, Merleau-Ponty, Maurice Merleau-Ponty, who analyzed uh, the meaning of, of reflexes. And he clearly shows that there are no reflexes in the Cartesian sense. And if uh, if you, if you uh, attend a neurology course, you'll probably uh, find people still uh, arguing that there are uh, simple uh, innate mechanical reflexes in, in the Descartes sense. Mm -hmm. And, um, uh, for example, the linguistics system of uh, Noam Chomsky is based entirely on this primitive false uh, idea of the brain function based on mechanical reflexes. Uh, and it simply doesn't work. Merleau-Ponty is probably the person who most clearly uh, explains the problems with it. But uh, in the Pavlovian picture, uh, as especially developed through the 1950s and 60s by his uh, student, uh, P.K. Anokan, mm -hmm. uh, uh, the, the sensory system is fluid and continuously being revised as the organism explores its environment. And so uh, the sense of exploring and being stimulated by newness, uh, the, the, uh, the idea of traveling through time and space is in charge over overriding defects in the motor system. Interesting. Uh, that, is, is this, that, that's is the this, relevant uh, picture, I think, uh, for seeing uh, disease, especially Parkinson's disease, uh, in a non-mechanical way. Uh, the uh, protein you mentioned, Dardarin, yeah, it, yeah. the interesting thing about it is that it shows up as a defect in Crohn's disease, in the intestine, as well as in Parkinson's disease. And Parkinson's typically starts with constipation. And uh, in 19th century medicine, uh, people remembered uh, the intestine as well as the brain in uh, treating disease. Uh, it was very common to diagnose uh, death as a result of inflammation of the bowel, which a pathologist typically overlook as just a, a side issue, but um, the, the intestine was recognized as very important, uh, and the brain as, as the other end of the or organism, that uh, sort of the two dimensions. And now doctors are taught that if you have a bowel movement three times a day or once every three days, it's all normal. <laughs> uh, yeah, uh, and when you trace out the, the chemical uh, links between uh, what's going wrong in the intestine and in the the rest of the motor system, uh, the behavioral system, and so on. Uh, you can see links, uh, but they're they're always uh, contextually working. Uh, there's no uh, simple pathogenic right. chemical in the intestine, but the the bacteria living in the intestine. Uh, the food you eat, and the way your intestine responds to it. And the stress you're exposed to. Yeah. Uh, these uh, act in, in the, uh, the uh, activating part of the brain. Uh, around 1950, uh, a part of the brain called the reticular activating system was identified. Mm -hmm. And uh, this uh, includes the region where the substantia nigra and the basal ganglia are. And uh, this is where uh, 
uh, sensory input is uh, dished out to activate uh, the upper parts of the brain. And when that's happening, uh, it tends to go with an inhibitory effect on the body. So the stronger your uh, mentality is dreaming, for example, Mm -hmm. uh, the more relaxed your body tends to be. And in Parkinson's, uh, the, the system... Really tends to be over activated, unable to relax properly. And so, a characteristic thing is that uh, during sleep and dreams, the, the person who is developing Parkinson's disease doesn't relax properly. The body, uh, if they have a dream, they might uh, scream and, and thrash around and hit people. Uh, so, the, there's a, a failure. Uh, of consciousness to override and, and relax the body. Now, can I just take you back to what you said a moment ago about, um, and it reminds me of inescapable stress and the rat experiments, um, and that being uh, countered uh, by the environmental enrichment that you said um, could totally restore uh, a, a Parkinson's created or induced uh, effect in a mouse that was put into a uh, environmental enrichment situation and actually lost the symptoms. Are, are you? Um, I know that one does not directly causatively cure the other, but you were saying here that <clears throat> there's a link between environmental enrichment and the progressive uh, replacement of. Um, gosh, what can we call it? Um, something substantially good that offsets the negative effects of the inflammation, the degradation, the slowing of the bowel, uh, endotoxin release, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, reabsorption, uh, and and that this is this is a definite key feature. That um, you think that you think it could be all oh, definitely as part of a holistic program. For sure, I can understand that would be very plausible to to, to suggest something like that. But is that where you were going to? Um, yeah, the, the uh, P.K. Anokan mm-hmm. and uh, all of the people in the Pavlovian tradition <clears throat> uh, uh, see a global uh, uh, event or process in the brain that they call the acceptor of action. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's uh, our intention and expectation in the world. Mm-hmm. And uh, this is... Um, uh, what is uh, integrating mm-hmm. not only the, the motor system and, and dominating the so-called reflexes, mm-hmm. but uh, this process, which is it's like a model of everything we know and intend to do in the world, uh, this is um, uh, supported in, in the organism, not just in the brain, but it's a process uh, involving sensory uh, nerves from uh, the the whole body. And uh, this process in the brain, uh, it it sort of, uh, during during daytime at least, it's uh, uh, based on our inner ear balance system, the vestibular uh, system. And uh, this... uh, it's a, a unified uh, picture of the world and the organism. And this process itself of being conscious is uh, involved in the activation of not only the endocrine, endocrine glands throughout the body, but in the nerves themselves as they <clears throat> are supporting uh, the, this uh, model of the world or acceptor of action in the process of metabolizing to be conscious they are making changes internally Mm -hmm. that involves for example synthesizing turning uh, uh, energy substances sugar for example Mm -hmm. into cholesterol Uh and turning cholesterol into pregnenolone Mm -hmm. right Mm -hmm. in the nerves for example of the substantia nigra. Right. Uh, this process is going on energy, uh, sugar, cholesterol, pregnenolone, progesterone, uh, and uh, the, um, the endocrine process. 
which is then stabilizing the structure and the consciousness so that the flavor of your consciousness, mm-hmm. when it's successful, is uh, modified by the, the balance you have between your progesterone, DHEA, and other steroids, yeah. and, and uh, the energy processes. So can you try to explain like the personality that you're saying in people that develop Parkinson's, they're not... Um, yeah, Getting... they, they're experiencing learned helplessness, I think. Uh, uh, the way they live, uh, they have incorporated uh, duties, obligations, and, and such that uh, they, they can manage uh, very well, but they aren't uh, overcoming the stress adequately. They're... But because they're not exploring new things, or they're not, they don't have new input to their brain, it's just the same old right. like, uh, treadmill they're on? Or? Yeah, they're stuck in a way so that they aren't getting enough sensory input. Stimulation yeah. to, um, that's so, that's so interesting because uh, I think when you read the, the regular texts, medical texts about Parkinson's, and they go through the plethora of symptoms, um, one of them, um, was a symptom most characteristic, I think, um, is uh, fairly emotionless expressions uh, on the patients with Parkinson's, um, not enthused, uh, difficult to engage, um, don't don't have any kind of um, uh, what can I say? Any any kind of joie de vivre? I don't know how else to say it apart from the French way. You know, kind of joy of life. Uh, but that that's very much part of uh, a learned helplessness type uh, construct that would cause um, an organism then to just see things just within the boundaries of what they have, and then not be anything new and stimulating them. And that stimulation you're saying is very much part of switching on what is a totally holistic approach uh, to Parkinson's outside of the mechanistic view that the regular science has. And we'll go through the drugs because the drugs are really not effective at all. And they work very mechanistically and they actually cause typically more problems uh, than they're seeking to to address. So are you saying new sensory output will, for example... Sensory input. I mean, sorry, new sensory input will, for example increase the dopamine output from the substantia nigra in the brain? Or the protective progesterone, pregnenolone. Uh, or the, the hormones that protect against those cells degrading, not producing dopamine. Yeah, the, the dopamine uh, theory, uh, it's really part, you have to look at it in, in the history. Uh, at, at the beginning of, of the 20th century, uh, with the mechanistic view, they were uh, seeing the brain as a mechanical thing which uh, was having defects causing the tremor and they actually started cutting out parts of the brain to remove the tremor (laughs) oh yeah that sounds like a good idea doesn't it Uh, the 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 man who invented the word cybernetics norbert wiener Uh uh-huh yeah uh, he proposed the best surgery up to that time, instead of cutting out uh, parts of the cortex, which they had been doing Gosh. in the 1930s, yeah. uh, they were focusing on the brain stem, and he designed the, uh, the radar mm-hmm. searching mm-hmm. Uh, uh, self-control systems that, that would um, focus on an airplane and uh, aim a gun, uh, uh, this feedback system, uh, he saw the brain uh, having tremors. His, his uh, radar gun aiming system, uh, if it was uh, poorly aligned, would have a tremor, uh, uh, a searching uh, mm-hmm. movement back and forth. So he saw the tremor as a, a feedback uh, searching process. Right. And so he suggested what he would do to his uh, radar apparatus was to uh, uh, knock out part of the sensitivity. So he suggested a surgery to cut out uh, part of the, the uh, searching feedback apparatus, yeah. and it actually worked better than, than the grosser <laughs> surgeries. And uh, that uh, it, it's been done right down uh, to the 70s and 80s. They were still simply 
ablating or destroying part of the brain. Uh, then they uh, got a little more refined <clears throat> and uh, <clears throat> started uh, stimulating it. Uh, but sometimes that didn't work, like uh, Michael Fox yeah. uh, said yeah. that uh, he wasn't going to have any more yeah. uh, surgical treatments because uh, instead of stopping the tremor of his left side, it yeah. started the tremor in the right side. Yeah. Well, that's the, that's the issue, isn't it? Well, I guess we'll get into some of the medications now, um, just to bring them out and to explain uh, the mechanistic view uh, that was constructed to support the use of these drugs. But, um, okay, so the substantia nigra uh, is part of the brain here that we're focusing on in Parkinson's that um, is the site of dopamine production. Now, dopamine, <coughs> excuse me, dopamine is... Um, I think I understand this right, but I, I, I think the nervous system is pretty much wanting to be firing fairly constantly, and the dopamine actually controls that from happening ad hoc, so that you don't get these sudden jerks, etc. And that dopamine allows, through this inhibition, the ordered uh, movement of muscles in coordinated patterns. It's not a stimulant per se, and well, that it, it's it's integrated with the inhibiting uh, systems. so it's much more of a relaxant. Yeah, in, in itself, it, it is an activator, but it runs into uh, nerves that uh, uh, feed back with an inhibition. Right, so when, when somebody, for example, I think L-DOPA is supposedly the gold standard, for want of a better word, uh, of treatment, and that within five years, most patients using L-DOPA as the replacement for dopamine, because L-DOPA, dopamine doesn't cross the blood-brain barrier as far as I know, but L-DOPA does, and within the brain, L-DOPA is converted into dopamine and then has uh, an, an action directly. But the long-term effects of L-DOPA are a condition called bradykinesia, where there's involuntary movements like there is in a fine tremor, a resting tremor, because, again, there's a differentiation, I guess, without getting too medical, there's a difference between intention tremors and resting tremors. Um, so resting tremors are typically something you can see in a Parkinson's patients uh, with either the leg uh, tremoring or the hand tremoring in a pill-rolling fashion. I always remember this from uh, studying, but they, they talk about pill-rolling tremor as one of the hallmark signs of uh, classical Parkinson's. So... Supp supp supplying somebody with L-DOPA uh, to treat that tremor does in initially have a positive beneficial effect. But how is it, I wonder, that the administration of dopamine over a chronic period of three, four, five years actually causes worse symptoms than the tremor for which it was prescribed? And most patients that um, use L-DOPA are in worse shape five years down the road than they are if they weren't treated. I, I think the problem is that the the whole theory of mm -hmm. what L-DOPA and dopamine are doing right. uh, is me mechanistic and mistaken. And so and they're just patching. They're just putting a little Band-Aid on it. They're not treating the, the yeah, sensory uh, input deficiency. Another drug that is approved for use in Parkinson's is uh, amandadine or mimantine okay. more recently. And uh, in the 19th century, they were already using... Uh, belladonna and hyoscyamine, okay. anticholinergics, to yeah. treat the tremors. Okay. And uh, they were pretty effective and didn't have uh, the bad side effects sure. of increasing rigidity and so on that, that L-DOPA does. Uh, and uh, the, um, it turns out that uh, these uh, uh, amandadine and mimantine have the anticholinergic, uh, anti-excitatory effects, but they are also anti-excitatory in the glutamatergic uh, system. Right. Um, uh, the the um, uh, glutamate and cholinergic systems are uh, both very powerful excitatory, and um, uh, the glutamate system ends up producing nitric oxide, okay. and uh, the amandadine and uh, uh, anticholinergics, mimantine, uh, are not only uh, stopping the 
the excitation that is part of the tremor, but uh, they end up uh, lowering the exposure to nitric oxide, and nitric oxide is a, a, a chronic stress-induced factor in suppressing mitochondrial respiration and energy production and accelerating aging of the brain. Mm -hmm. uh, so uh, using, uh, using these approved drugs, is um, it actually is giving insight into what's going on to a much more global uh, organismic process rather than just uh, restoring the lost so-called dopamine yeah. uh, uh, regulatory system. It, mm -hmm. It's restoring energy processes, uh, reducing the effects of, of stress in a systematic way. Okay, you're listening to Ask Your Rep, Dr. Kami D. Garaville, 91.1 FM. Uh, from now until the end of the show, you're invited to call in with any questions about this subject of endocrinology and Parkinson's disease. If you live in the area, the temporary number for the 707 region is 383-9007, and the 800 number is 800-568-3723. So I see the lights flashing here, so let's, let's take the first call and see where we're going. Caller, you're on the air, and what's your question? Hi, I'm from the San Francisco Bay Area, Hi, and I was question? wondering, are there simple things that someone can do, like a stepping stone to get out of learned helplessness for, you know, for people that are overcoming hypothyroidism and still find it overwhelming to do big tasks or big things? What was the very first thing you said, a stepping a, stone? A stepping to, stone to get out of get the learned out. helplessness. <clears throat> Dr. P, do you think there is a, uh, a progressive... Um, course that can be followed to get out. Yeah, of or what do you what do you suggest to increase sensory input to the brain? Oh, um, and the, and the, and to help get out of the learned helplessness. Uh, Painting behavioral things <laughs> like um, uh, going new places, mm -hmm. uh, meeting new people, uh, doing uh, very different things uh, that you've never done before, but thought you might enjoy doing. Uh, at the same time, uh, as you uh, try to correct your your energy processes that are suppressed, um, uh, having uh, more enjoyable, more varied meals, for example, and uh, making sure that your thyroid function is good. I know you Thank told you me much. when I asked you what was it, one of the best things I could teach our daughter or what's a good education for our daughter. And you said introduce her to new people, mm -hmm. and she loves she to loves meet it. new people. <laughs> and she gets so fired up. Okay. So, Dr. P, I think um, just uh, on, the, on the basis of that last call, in terms of, um, gosh, new things, I mean, I think everybody, I think arguably everybody would, um, most people, let's not say everybody, that's too uh, all-inclusive, um, you know, people... I think have a, a bucket list of 20 things they'd like to do, you know, whether it's jumping out of an aircraft and uh, with, you know, with a parachute and, uh, I don't know, just, uh, just fast things or exciting things or going to new places. Um, I think outside of the scope of that, because most people probably th they think they can't afford it or they don't have the time for it, <clears throat> how do you think about um, creative, uh, creative outlets like painting? and or constructing poetry or as long as that's not something you do every day anyway as long as it's not something you do every day <laughs> yeah i'm just thinking of it as a construct that would be uh maybe more more easily attained rather than dr pete doesn't want to give a prescription here i can <laughs> tell that <laughs> um yeah doing something unexpected uh, out of the routine mm -hmm. uh, and uh, some people uh, actually uh, quit their job and, and learn a new profession or, or yeah. new trade. Yeah. Okay, Let, let's get into some of the, um, some of the things that I'd uh, have spoken with you about earlier that were things that are in keeping with the whole anti-inflammatory process that you're saying is, is all part and parcel of this breakdown. Uh, so I guess mitochondrial function, I'm getting pretty... Um, pretty interested about the whole approach to uh, supporting mitochondria and uh, whether it's coenzyme Q10 or uh, other kind of new 
uh, uh, nootropics and things like that. I know you're not particularly keen on nootropics uh, and, and drugs that supposedly enhance mental perfunction and or mitochondrial function because you you don't uh, you don't really put a lot of uh, uh, value to it. But in in terms of mitochondria and uh, and their obvious role in energy production and how energy in the body is at the root of paying for all the transactions how do you feel uh, about mitochondrial support uh, in the in the approach to a parkinson's patient um uh, getting getting good rest is part of of the support stopping okay. uh, unnecessary excitatory stimulation uh, good stimulation uh, should be fun rather than stressful and uh, so not jumping out of an aircraft. <laughs> uh, uh, <laughs> well, unless yeah. you find that fun. That's stressful, uh, probably. The, the, um, Riding a uh, roller coaster, I mean, that might be a little bit stressful. It's fun, right? <laughs> yeah, everything that is anti-inflammatory uh, can be relaxing as well as stimulating. Uh, caffeine is extremely protective against uh, all of the defects in Parkinson's disease. Uh, and... Uh, it activates while protecting the mitochondria. Um, uh, gamma hydroxybutyrate, which is in uh, some plants, yeah. like uh, uh, the um, um, passion flower. Uh, yeah, the, the tropical fruit. What's it called? Uh, 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 the, um, uh, it, it's. Um, uh, I wonder if it's. Wait. You're not. He was thinking you meant GABA. Oh uh, well, it's it's um, uh, an activator, gamma hydroxybutyrate. Okay, well butyrate. the passion fruit or the liliquoi yeah. or what yeah, else? Yeah, pas passion fruit yeah. is. Um, the other name is. I was looking for. Yeah, I thought it might be, but I didn't want to jump in there. Grenadilla, I, I think, I, is another name for it. Um, uh, yeah, it's something we make uh, along with GABA, which which helps to um, uh, eliminate uh, stressful. Overexcitation. Uh, the the synuclein, which is one of the things that goes wrong and uh, is damaged in Parkinson's disease, it happens to have the same effect as rotenone, wow. uh, the, the toxic uh, thing that has been seen to cause uh, something exactly like Parkinson's disease by blocking uh, the complex one of the mitochondrion. So then all of the herbs that act on the GABA um, would be useful, are you saying? Yeah, yeah. Uh, and um, even uh, cannabis has been, uh, because of its uh, sedative effects, it can be protective uh, against the, the toxic types of overstimulation. And what about alcohol? Um, yeah, I think uh, it's um, antioxidant, can be anti-inflammatory, and can be, uh, in the right circumstance, it can be anti-Parkinson's. Uh, anti now, how about this? Then? Nicotine, as I've seen a fair amount of research showing that nicotine is actually protective, significantly protective against Parkinson's in a, in a big study that's been done. Um, yeah, I think the uh, population effect where they see that smokers have uh, uh, somewhat protection against Parkinson's, I think part of that effect is that it, uh, relieves constipation. It activates uh, the mm -hmm. intestine, and uh, that in itself has an anti-inflammatory, anti-toxic effect. Interesting. Okay, so, so what do you think uh, is the best method for delivery of nicotine? Like making a, a tea uh, out of I mean, it's not... I, I think either um, absorbing it through the skin uh, as uh, in the form of an ointment, or uh, uh, ingesting very small amounts of, of the leaf, tobacco leaf. Very, very quickly, I think while we're, while we're talking about um, tobacco, I read an article today that's now saying that the uh, vaping craze that's really starting to take off and reintroduce smoking to a younger generation is actually showing up with some fairly disturbing health effects. Um, it's kind of early days yet for the uh, research to come through, but they're actually saying that even uh, it could be even some even worse uh, side effects to vaping than there would have been to uh, smoking, uh, obtaining nicotine that way. So nicotine in its own right is not 
Uh, well, I mean, it's a neurotoxin for sure, but it's not a good molecule, but it's not the poisonous component. In tobacco smoke, it's mainly the carcinogens, correct, and the tar, but, um, but nicotine can have some therapeutic effects. Um, yeah, and, and keeping the intestine healthy because of the... Um, when endotoxin in itself reaches the nervous system, uh, it locally as well as uh, systemically uh, activates processes that uh, lead to the, uh, the same blockage of mitochondrial respiration that rotenone does or that um, uh, ionizing radiation does uh, in a chronic sense. Uh, having uh, uh, CAT scans of the head, I think, mm-hmm. is probably a part of the the reason <clears throat> that um, Parkinson's prevalence has increased so greatly right. over the last 20 or 30 years. Because they're pretty keen to give you CAT scans for anything. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> oh, well, it's a shame. But I, um, I'm, hope- I'm hopeful that uh, in time things far less damaging will become more commonplace, a little bit like the uh, switch in attitudes towards saturated fats from the uh, long-protected... Uh, polyunsaturates that have been shown to, to do so much damage. Now, how about um... aspirin is another okay. thing mentioning the, the polyunsaturated fats. Um, w- one of the uh, prostaglandins produced in substantia nigra it is very toxic to the brain, and simply having a regular use of aspirin will protect against that prostaglandin made from the polyunsaturated fats. Okay. And the breakdown of the polyunsaturated fats, acrolein it mm-hmm. is mm-hmm. a very toxic material uh, that we produce internally from yeah. the polyunsaturates. And that uh, is one of the things that turns synuclein into a, a toxic fibrous material, sort of like the prions in mad cow yeah. disease. Interesting. Because now, what do you think about this this uh, concept that the... Um, I, think, I think I was reading that they haven't actually proved beyond a doubt that these Lewy bodies, which do show up in the substantia on, on uh, micro, uh, you know, microscopical evaluation, they may be, or they may have a protective role. I mean, I think they've made them pathognomic and kind of diagnostic uh, for the confirming... Parkinson's, but they, they may actually have a kind of a, a protective role. And uh, I, th- I think the body might be parking uh, to get out of the way yeah. some of these synuclein fibrils yeah. and packing them up in, in little compartments that are relatively safe. Uh, but some of the, the toxic uh, fibrils of, of syn- synuclein uh, are known to be uh, passed from one cell to another, causing uh, a damage to the cell that receives it. Yeah. Well, I, 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 I wanted to ask you, Dr. Pete, when you were talking about this rapid movement and dream state, you know, for people who are developing Parkinson's, or what about people who've had that for years and years and years? Is that not also a, a symptom of low thyroid because their, their muscles just can't relax, or is it the brain that can't relax? So I'm trying to understand that a little bit better. Um, it's the same thing. Nothing in the body can relax fully when your uh, thyroid function is low. Uh, that's one of the funny things that uh, came out of the uh, idea of the, the cell as an, a compartment enclosed in a membrane. Uh, that uh, the, If you think of it as a, a corpuscle that has to be in a state ready to work when it's rested, uh, the state where it's ready to perform its job is a high energy state, and mm-hmm. that's the well rested state, full of energy, ready to go. Uh, if you don't have enough uh, of the thyroid and uh, glucose and oxygen, whatever, to um, produce the energy, uh, you stay in a, a semi contracted, excited uh, state. Uh, so uh, what happens in Parkinson's is this uh, reaches a, a, a chronically deadly cell-killing condition. Uh, in chronic hypothyroidism, it, it's simply a, a nuisance that uh, your sleep isn't 
as restful as it should be. You can't get into the deep, relaxing, restorative sleep because you don't have enough energy. Uh, so the cells uh, are not ready to work. They haven't accumulated the energy and structure needed to uh, do a, a, a proper job. And so they keep churning through the uh, energy-producing process without uh, relaxing and storing up the energy as, as glycogen, ATP, creatine, phosphate, and so on. Hmm. Okay. Well, I know there was uh, more questions uh, surrounding things like the uh, monoamine oxidase inhibitors, the uh, the A and B inhibitors, and how they have been used with varying degrees. But ultimately, this uh, condition doesn't have any real course of action for it, other than uh, trying to offset the symptoms as long as possible, followed by palliative care. Um, I would very much like to carry on this uh, subject next month just to break down some of the things that are definitely shown, like lack of testosterone is definitely shown and uh, ameliorates, makes better the symptoms of Parkinson's. Um, reducing estrogen, because estrogen is kind of uh, very inflammatory and uh, kind of anti anti-restful uh, type um, organism, uh, molecule. Um, I know there were plenty of other things, and as usual, I'm sorry, we only got one call. I didn't really plug too much for people to come on the air, but I've kind of been a bit, little bit selfish this month. Um, maybe next month, if uh, you're able, would you uh, be willing to carry on with this? Oh, yeah. Great. I really appreciate that. Well, for those people who've listened to the show, thanks so much for your time, Dr. Pete. Okay, thank you. For those people thank who you for who've listened to the show, uh, thanks so much for uh, either calling in like you have and or listening. We know that I get a, such a lot of feedback from people. I get it every week from people. They just write me and they come from all over, <laughs> not just a guy from Norway or, you know, uh, yeah, Finland. It, fin <laughs> Finland, yeah. They come from all over. So I get emails from people from the UK. I get them from South America. I get them from, the, from Asia even, you know. So they listen all over the world. And I think it's very important that um, it's a, a resource that we freely make available. KMUD makes it available for you to download this podcast uh, after that sh show hours on the audio archive. And on our website, I'm compiling what's turning out to be a pretty big compendium of uh, Dr. Pete uh, shows. So until the third Friday of next month, uh, we'll carry on with endocrinology as a bigger section anyway, going over all the rest of it in the months to come. But we'll try and wrap up the Parkinson's uh, debate next month. I know Dr. Pete has other suggestions that we didn't even get into. Um, my name's Andrew Murray. My name's Sarah Johannesson Murray, and do you want to give out sure. contact details? Yeah, sure. Um, well, we can be reached Monday through Friday, 9 to 5. I have a toll-free number. Would you like to? <laughs> no, I wanted to give out Dr. Pete's um, oh, yeah, of course. website. You forgot to do that. I did, and I, I don't have my crib in front of me, my, my uh, crib sheet. Anyway, so Dr. Pete is obviously, he's reachable, www.raypete.com. He's got plenty of articles there, fully referenced. Uh, he's written several books, too. He's not selling anything. He's just giving you information, folks. So take him up on it while he's still, allow while he's still around. He's still willing to do this. And uh, our phone number is 888-WBM-HERB for Western Botanical Medicine Herb. Okay, thanks for joining us. Thanks for listening. Good night.